thank you, Rachel, for uh, your introduction. I have to begin with a warning, which I always start a talk with, and that is, that although my lecture's planned to fit within about an hour, um, since I stutter, you know, there's always a chance we may only get to the first two pages of my text. <laughs> it's a risk we all take together. Um, I also want to thank um, on your faculty here and your staff here, Doug Noble, Jane Ilgen, um, Rachel, and Ken Breisch for helping make my lecture possible and friendly. And again, thank uh, Ken Breisch and, and two other current and, and uh, former USC faculty, David Sloan and Greg Heiss, um, um, as well as two UCLA faculty members, Del Upton and Karen Kevork Kevorkian, um, who've been, uh, this, this whole group, have been long-term colleagues, and I've learned an awful lot from them, and a lot of the ideas I'm going to be giving you, I may have messed up, but they're ideas I've learned from these folks. So don't blame them if things are stupid and give them all the credit if I say anything worthwhile. Um, I'm very honored to be part of USC's 2010 Spring Architecture Lecture Series, and I'm also honored to be giving the Suzanne Deal Booth and David G. Booth Lecture on Historic Preservation. The Booths are international leaders in the recognition and the preservation of architecture, and their philanthropy has positively touched a great uh, many buildings and many lives as well. In a few minutes, I'll explain what these, these two images are doing on the screen, but let me just launch in to give you a little background as to where this lecture is coming from. At Berkeley, I teach a year-long lecture course that surveys the ordinary, everyday American landscape. It's an elective class. A different and required year-long course teaches the history of high style design. Uh, my course does occasionally look at architect-designed environments. However, it is more likely to ask about the 95% of the American-built environment that architects do not design. Self-built, low-income housing, very average neighborhoods, and commercial strips along major urban streets. And at least a third of the course is rural, looking at farms, fields, highways, and small towns. This cultural landscape history course has a good deal of myself in it because I've been teaching it for over 25 years. However, in the 1960s and 1970s, the course was invented by the eminent environmental philosopher and maverick scholar John Brinkerhoff Jackson. At several points in this talk, I will be quoting Mr. Jackson. For 17 years, he was the founding editor and publisher of Landscape Magazine. And then for 10 years, he taught as a visiting lecturer in landscape architecture at Berkeley and at Harvard. In between semesters, Jackson lived at his home in the high desert of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Jackson was a world traveler and a true self-taught cultural geographer. Uh, he was one of those rare people who brought delight as well as intellectual rigor to asking about whatever people put on the ground. Um, in my Berkeley classes, I've tried to maintain Jackson's wildly eclectic and inclusive vision um, to present houses, barns, factories, office towers, and suburbs with neither approval nor disapproval necessarily, but with genuine interest and curiosity with the attitude that all built environments can tell us something important about human societies, human cultures, and human power relations. By the end of the survey course, my students are often confused, <laughs> not surprisingly since I'm teaching the class, um, but they say to read the landscape on our own, what, where should we look? Um, and they continue, how do we recognize a good landscape, a healthy environment? And these are big, complicated questions that have no s s simple answers. Yet, as designers and as policymakers, uh, those of us in the design professions are often required to find very quickly, often far too quickly, operating assumptions about a place that we may know very little about. Uh, that is what we are asking tonight, uh, although we will not hammer down any neat answers to those big questions. My goal is literally to complicate your ideas of what to look at in order to understand the environments in which we design and live, both high style settings and ordinary environments. The point also is to complicate 
your ideas of preservation by challenging you to read everything you see and experience in cultural landscapes before you launch into answering the questions of why, what, or how to preserve any one part of the landscape. Um, as uh, the landscape designer Sir Jeffrey Jellico has put it, to plant a garden within a garden, which is what we're always doing as designers, we're adding a building to a set of buildings that are already there. Even on a blank slide, site, we are adding something to something that already exists. And he says, to plant a garden within a garden, you have to recognize that larger garden. And that's sort of my goal uh, to help you towards tonight. Um, and now I push, I have a button, I think we were, we were experimenting earlier here, I think it's AV presentation. Yeah, cool. No, that's not the right one. We want to do video, I guess. Yeah, that's the right one. I can see if you're falling asleep, I don't care. I know it's, it's getting towards the end of the day, uh, but at least I know and now that you're falling asleep. All right. Um, uh, quite reasonably, environmental designers, professional designers, might look first for a good design in artistic form or style, properly applied. Hence, Frank Geary's uh, Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles would have more interest than an everyday backyard in an American suburban home. This is a J.B. Jackson slide. Um, however, for the moment, if you'll just bear with me, let's assume that both environments are equally interesting, uh, just interesting in different ways. Uh, folklorists would look for authenticity, perhaps, uh, and probably choose the Pennsylvania Amish farm on the left as the more healthy environment of these two. However, a few miles away, uh, because the Amish are a tourist attraction, uh, this tourist site might be equally or, or necessary, is not necessarily more authentic, the, the farm is not necessarily more authentic than this place where you can buy Amish stuff. <laughs> and Amish food like shoe fly pies, the main ingredient of which is brown sugar. Um, people with a sense of humor uh, uh, might judge a healthy place by looking for creativity and fun, as with the alligator jaws at the entrance to the Luray Caverns in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And this is a Del Upton photo. My camera uh, jammed right at this moment. It was having so much fun with the, <laughs> it stopped taking taking photos. Um, uh, however, uh, this evening, instead of style, authenticity, or humor as a primary focus for cultural landscape analysis, I'd like to propose social connections. Connection here needs a very generic de definition. Links and exchanges between one group of people and another group of people. Pe 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 people. The term, as we will use it, includes both physical connections and the less visible flows and interchanges that are part of connection. Flows of energy, human travel, information, and capital as well. So you're saying, what are we looking at? We're looking at a US highway going to Paradise Valley, Nevada. Um, and the connections, you can, you've already picked up the highway itself as a connection between Winnemucca and Paradise Valley. Uh, the uh, electric lines here, but also the U.S. mailbox invented in 1895 when, uh, when a free rural delivery uh, was uh, invented by the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Postal Service, and also this, high, this sign way over here in the west that says Ferraro Ranch, I believe. From this angle, I have no idea what it says. And um, it's this ranch that's off on this gravel road to the side here. It's probably a mile, the ranch stead's a mile away. But the Ferraras want to know, want you to know, driving by, that they're here. They're reaching out to connect to you just as you drive by. It helps probably get packages delivered. Um, but it's also something for the people who are, they could have just put a number there and not said what their, ran, their, 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 ran, their name of their ranch was or their name. Um, so connections can be hallways between rooms, railroad networks, sidewalks, Main Street retail districts, or telecommunications. Um, I took this picture a very long time ago in Oregon, in a V-shaped Oregon mountain valley, which it had no TV because TV uh, doesn't go into mountain valleys very well from an antenna. But of course, from a satellite, which is always looking almost straight down, they could put on a satellite dish like this. This was enormous. I should have a scale figure next to it, but it's you know probably 10 feet across. And they went from having zero channels of, of television to 256 
channels of, of, of television thanks to uh, these things. So connection changing very much um, in about 1983. Now, when I was a kid, and, and if you had told me I'd have a little antenna the size of my fist on the back of my car, which will give me you know, 256 radio stations, I would have said, you're crazy. And now I have an antenna you know, much, much smaller than this that is, in fact, connecting me to, I actually use only three of those 256 stations, but it's very nice to have the same station wherever I travel across the United States. Um, so it's a new kind of connection. Um, the anthropologist Clifford Gertz defines culture as the webs of significance we ourselves have spun. And social connections are the circuitry of those webs of sig sig significance. Social connections, in fact, channel the entire metabolism of any cultural landscape. Thus, particular connections are like crucial pressure points in the blood system, strategic places to measure the pulse and vitality of places and the people in them. And hence, they're useful for us as designers or, or scholars to look for. Um, here are two maps of north, uh, I think it's western, yes, northwestern Iowa, 1928, 1980. Now, between these two decades, a rural population actually declined significantly, but the, the all-weather connections, paved roads, um, have increased enormously. Uh, so uh, there's a, a, a market increase in rural residents' chances to get around, especially during wet or w winter weather in a place like this. But this is the literal sort of example you might expect on your own. Uh, to be more broad-ranging, there are at least six different categories or realms of social connection that may be useful as part of reading the landscape. Uh, these will be the six uh, points we'll, uh, we'll use to structure the lecture tonight. First, connection to self, then connection to one's own group, to other groups, to change, to continuity, and finally, to the wilder parts of nature. These categories are intentionally very general. Next year, I might have four other categories or there are only two categories, or you may have a different set of categories yourself. There's no one perfect list. This is a starter list. Um, but let's start with the first realm of connection. Um, the basic level of connection is not social, but in fact individual. Connection to the self. A good landscape connects its participants to themselves as individuals. Much of this is invisible inside, inside people's minds. Yet there are external traces. For instance, rich sensory experiences like the shininess of this diner um, or other environmental stimuli that tell us uh, that we are alive and that we are doing well. Um, time at the beach or in a forest in front of a vivid painting in a house of worship or in a mountain valley uh, provides a space and time for people to get in touch with themselves, to take time out they wouldn't take at work or even at home. You don't need to be a committed phenomenologist to care about the roles that sensory inputs play in our individual consciousness, although it helps if you're a phenomenologist. Um, good connections uh, uh, give the individual some viable point of attachment to their surroundings, some way to make the notion of I am visible and knowable. Some of the means are uh, like um, this front yard here and a house south of Denver. Um, and uh, uh, these were very ordinary plantings um, are carefully thought out autobiographies of the family inside the house. Um, the phrase, getting in touch with ourselves, sounds very s s 60s, I'm afraid, but some of us remember the, s the 60s in spite of what we were smoking in the 60s. But um, the phrase, getting in touch with ourselves, implies something concrete. We're touching something. So there is a physical landscape, a, a built environment, a material culture uh, component uh, to all of that. Um, so this is what some people put in their front yard. Uh, this is what David Rockefeller puts in one of his front yards, uh, the WFA sculpture there in the front of Chase Manhattan Bank in New York. Um, it, it Kevin Lynch um, writes that place identity hinges on personal identity. Uh, that I am here supports the feeling of I am. 
and lunch with someone who had a lot to say about the sense of place and its importance. The Saul Bass film, Why Man Creates, and surely today he would call it Why Humans Create, um, ends with a naive but a haunting conclusion. We create, he says, simply to say, I am. In a rural cemetery in Lunenburg, Virginia, saying I am may be personally writing the name of a loved one on a handmade tombstone over a scraped grave, a long African-American rural tradition. In the landscape of multinational business, uh, that means David Rockefeller's mighty Chase Manhattan Tower, which he, that building there, with uh, SOM's collective design talent poured into it. Both are elegant, eloquent and powerful statements. What separates them are the realities of social class and economic power. If anything, we are all too good at identifying individual life. Um, and this keys too easily into the assumption, rarely completely true, of seeing the landscape as a series of linked but individually authored elements. So human life um, is not atomistic. Um, as the sociologist Russ Ellis has put it, human life is inherently, necessarily, group life. Uh, individuality, whether destructive or creative, hating or loving, is nurtured in social interchange. And this brings us to the second realm of connection, uh, which links individuals to their sense of belonging to a group. This is the physical half of social survival, saying we are in environmental terms, expressing belonging, membership, and social order to the members of that order. In the 19th century, giving people a place in a real town in the US, making urban turf, meant filing a plat with an orderly grid plan, like the one you see in front of you here, of streets, blocks, and lots. Now this was the Illinois Central Standard Town Plan. You filled in the name of the town up here, and each town in the Illinois Central had the same set of streets and, and uh, street names, uh, which were patterned after Philadelphia. So across Illinois in 1850 were these little scale models of Philadelphia, true urban places starting out with that street grid. Um, for members of the Dirt, of the dirt Gang, um, marking their place in the cosmos, in this case, an abandoned schoolyard in San Francisco, meant putting their name on a high wall and then making uh, a signature wall of graffiti nearby. We learn uh, important social lessons inside our houses too, even if we live alone. The rules used to arrange and connect our rooms are in fact abstract social links. Um, and repeating them, using them, often tells us who we are. Um, we're looking here at a worker's cottage. It's just about to be moved, so it doesn't look so hot. All the windows are, are, are covered up. But it was lived in until 1995 when a team of Berkeley students and I began to document houses like this in this area of West Oakland. Um, the BART tracks are right behind us there. And if you know where BART goes underground in the East Bay, uh, you know this is just before BART goes underground on its way to San Francisco. And we measured the house, and we found that this was its plan. We could tell by the way it was constructed that these two rooms, the front two rooms here, were constructed first. In fact, the front door used to be there, we know from a historic photo. Uh, but now, the, and the first two rooms, in fact, were built a year before the railroad got to West Oakland. Uh, in 1868. Uh, we know that in just 10 years, these two rooms have been added, and that uh, African-American family lived in the house, um, and they had done very well. The father was a, uh, a, a hair, hair cutter, and his daughter became a very well-known entertainer in the East Bay. And she'd say, I was born on Pine Street. You can go and see the house if you want to, and this is that house. Uh, but as you walked into the house with the addition on it, you walked into a room, and there was a room here, sort of a kitchen, and then you walked into another room, and then you walked into another room. There's no hallway. Uh, each room is part of the next room's life, and, and all rooms are sort of interconnected very informally. Uh, a back porch, wash porch was added on, and eventually a toilet and a shower in the back. Um, but the date of the toilet was, was 1947. So it had an outdoor toilet until then, probably. Um, so these connections, this arrangement of rooms, is telling the people who live in those rooms uh, who they are, and is arranging the sense of their lives. Um, one room is almost as good as another room. Um, 
At its largest, this house was 500 square feet. Um, if we go just around the corner to, an, again, another couple houses just about to be moved, but they again were lived in until 1995 in West Oakland, uh, we see here an almost modern uh, uh, house plan, a house built all at once with five rooms. We know by uh, a, a Southern Pacific carpenter, Thomas Stevens, he, uh, he built the house in 1889, so it's a little later than the work, worker's cottage. Um, we know that he brought over his mother from England and three brothers. So they were a non-traditional household. It was mom taking care of four unmarried brothers who all worked for Southern Pacific. And uh, two bedrooms in the house, but they each opened into a social room, the back bedroom into the kitchen, the front bedroom into sort of a dining room here. There's a, a double parlor, we would sometimes call it in formal literature. But notice how the front door, that door there, opens into a separate little airlock, a little hallway. It's not fancy, it's not large, but it allows someone to be a formal visitor to come to the front door and not see into the house when they come and when the front door is open. It allows them to rent out the front room to a roomer that has a door there. They close the double doors here. A roomer can have that door and come and go without really in interrupting the, the family very much and then could run around the back of the house to use uh, an outhouse in the back. Um, the kitchen has a little pass-through, so the lady of the house could cook, and then if she wanted to be fancy and they were eating in the dining room, which they probably didn't do very often, um, she could put the food here, take off her apron, come out the door, and pick up the food in the little serving area and put it on the table as if she had help in the kitchen. Um, so that English immigrant mother had a way to kind of put on sort of middle class airs. And we call this sort of a uh, house of emergence or a zone of emergence house. And what they're emerging into is the middle class. And the marker is that dining room, that fifth room in the plan, and the formality of having a little hallway. It would help if there were a bedroom hall so these bedrooms didn't open directly into another place. So these interiors, they're private, but they're important social connections uh, within a private house. Other signs of active social connections in a landscape are people forthrightly using social space as part of their lives. As shown in, as shown in this image, um, happy birthday Dave uh, for Aero Heating, um, he and his co-workers certainly have a place in this downtown block. And in this view, um, the little sign that says, it's a boy, here on a paper placemat, um, it's in downtown Buffalo, New York. It points towards some very healthy human relations among the customers and the cafe workers inside. Someone clearly assumes that the people walking by on the sidewalk would care about the arrival of that baby. Now you would think in a small town in the Midwest, this would not be unusual, but in Buffalo, New York, it's not what you'd expect downtown. Um, these may be people who are not only living where they sleep, but also living where they work. And in the US, that's a fairly radical or old-fashioned idea. Uh, if the social connections of a cultural landscape are in good working order, the groups of people have enough human contact levels for social groups to flourish. One geographer facetiously uses the term hubits for bits of human contact. And healthy landscapes, he writes, provide rich levels of hubits. Um, like the hearty socializing that was easily found on small main streets um, during the 1940s. This is um, uh, 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 Caldwell, Idaho, photographed in 1942 by the Foreign Security Administration uh, photographers. Um, and the people are probably waiting for store clerks to fill their orders. That's when the grocery stores weren't self-service. You'd give someone a list, and then you had about 45 minutes or an hour to kind of hang out. And here they are, hanging out uh, on the sidewalk, talking while, while a human being puts together your list in a, in, inside a store. Now, I think that's the way to go. <coughs> buy, buy the week's groceries. Um, now, uh, on a main street in South Dakota, uh, we might have seen exclusion, not just social life or hubits. Uh, exclusion of those who don't belong, like this sign that says no beer sold to Indians. Indeed, each of the six types of connections has its adverse side. 
Each connection is simultaneously a separation. Saying, happy birthday, Dave, uh, speaks to the people who know Dave, uh, but also separates out those of us who do not know Dave. Um, so in these many different ways, we could go on with thousands of examples. I'll spare you the other 999. But um, identity takes place. Our individual identity takes place. And our social identity takes place. My students at Berkeley think you know, much of their identity is coming from a computer screen, but they're sitting in a room or a place when they're looking at that computer screen or they're looking at the uh, those things? iPhones yeah, that they're looking at. Um, so uh, we have to keep thinking about identity and where it's coming. It's certainly augmented in, in electronic ways, but we still are in a built environment. Um, we can see then that the major issues of connecting a social group revolve around who is considered a member and who is not. The complexities of human social life bring with them the need for constant concern for equity and justice. So we want that, these should be on our list of things to look for in a healthy landscape. And it comes under the category of social groups. Uh, the view on your left, taken out of context, might be, mistakenly, might be mistaken as a healthy landscape. The railroad baron right here, uh, Lloyd Tebbis, the founder of Wells Fargo Bank, is chatting with two of his tycoon friends on the top floor of his home at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, one of the places where these three men lived. Uh, you see that the, their servants are waiting in the background in case they need something. Uh, these men were very well connected, but not to the workers a few blocks away who built the railway so important to their wealth. Just two blocks away from the Palace Hotel were huge workers' hotels where men, like the man on the right, lay dying of tuberculosis contracted at work. Victorian high society, much like our own, did not concern itself greatly with uneven development and other issues of how opportunities and resources were distributed in a settlement or society. The migrant workers, like the man on the right, were not well connected to Lloyd Tevis's successful business skills, except when they had sporadic employment from him. These issues of Equity and justice are not just urban issues. Access to loans and capital are the key elements that separate these two farmsteads photographed in, the, in Nebraska only a year or two apart. Um, so here is a very proud farm family. They're living in a sod hut, but they have gotten loans from the bank for the seed they've planted on, on the first fields that they've uh, opened up, and they've got all this equipment. The wife's got her hand on a butter churn there, I believe. I think there's a hired hand somewhere in the back of the animals, but um, it says where his status stands. But um, again, so they got out on a limb to, to, to invest in things. Here's someone who has had lots more access to capital at the bank. They're starting out on a much higher plane. A fancy big house built all at once, two barns, wagons, and a buggy just for going into town. Uh, very big family. Uh, now he may well be a banker in town, and this may well be a hobby farm that he's going to hire a manager to run for. It. Just wants to live on the rural landscape. So it, it's access to capital. Uh, we have to keep looking for um, in the landscape, and, and the landscape is a great place to see social stratification or social class or both um, at work if you begin to look for it. Um, and that brings us to the, a third type of connection. Connection between a group of, uh, between a group and to outsiders can be as important as links within a group. Um, research in the social sciences has shown that once a social group's internal relations are sound, they usually tend to reach out some way or another. They tend to exhibit a kind of pride. They invite you to join them, or at least they make themselves clear to non-members. In short, they are people openly saying, we are, and we want you to know we are. Um, the landscape clues that show an exceptional outreach attitude are often very simple. Open doors, a fence with a style over it, uh, signs or labels which clarify the landscape for outsiders. Retail environments, they want to welcome you in and they want to look as, as wealthy as possible. And they'll spiff up their sign to do that and their store windows to do that. Here in Wairika, California, the northern part of the state, um, this is a very plugged in town, maybe a tiny town, but as you drive into the town, they want to tell you, we may be tiny, but we're plugged into the nation. We've got a Lions Club, we've got a Kiwanis Club, we've got an Oddfellows, we've got a Mason's Hall. 
Uh, and then we got, I think, I counted 13 churches. And if you have to go on a Sunday, uh, they would love to have you drop in. Um, and um, so this sign is sort of proclaiming in this tiny place, we are. And welcome to our world, um, at least certain parts of our world, the, the, ch the chamber of commerce and church world. Um, here, uh, I, I can't tell you where in Los Angeles area I was, probably in Bell or Cudahy. There's this sort of one of those many anonymous buildings, and they, they tell us what's going on inside. They're handling carrots inside. And it's great graphics, and maybe it won't handmade, but boy is it good. And um, it just it just pops out. I went through, just, uh, I was driving from Culver City to here this afternoon, and I must, must have gone by a thousand buildings that didn't tell me what was going on inside. So it's quite simple. If you want people to know, to say what's going on is that the JT distribution company doesn't tell us much, but home of the topless carrot. I think this is one of the slides we used to advertise the talk. It was so baffling, that's probably why the number of people here is relatively small. Um, so here, they're saying, this is what we do in here. Um, good landscape connections to the people from other landscapes means semi-permeable membranes instead of rigid, sterile walls. You'll notice this entire lecture is a argument by analogy, so just flow with it, if you will. Um, uh, like biological cells, when they lose their semi-permeable walls, they have no permeability or too much permeability, they atrophy. So the right balance of inside to outside uh, in, in landscapes is something to look for. Now, Chamber of Commerce greetings and sign painting good cheer are easy to see. There are, of course, much more difficult, more powerful issues uh, and relations between groups. We know them as terms like race, class, gender, religion, uh, sex, sexuality. Um, and the connective tissue of these social group relationships can and often can be seen. Um, let's take social class, or if you prefer, social stratification uh, in a factory landscape that I've done some work on. On the left is the site plan of the Union Iron Works. It's a, it's a preliminary drawing for a fancy painting that's going to be used in corporate uh, uh, logos. Um, the Union Iron Works was a San Francisco shipbuilding firm with about 5,000 employees. Uh, they all were moved to a new greenfield site in 1883. And we're looking at that new site. Uh, uh, we see the machine shop, is this, a pair of buildings right there, um, and a storage yard that is just left blank in the, in the drawing. But this is that, 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 that storage yard. Um, and it's got a definitely haphazard and idiosyncratic organization, although it's all based on how the internal railroad moves articles around um, in that site. Now, new owners of the Union Ironworks uh, from the eastern U.S., Bethlehem Steel, bought this site in 1904. Uh, now, very early, the Bethlehem had adopted the efficiency ideas of Frederick Winslow Taylor, Mr. Efficiency. And uh, these rail changes, which we look at, here is the railroad uh, connections of the Union Ironworks up to about 1904. Um, and you can see that storage yard's right there. And here is what it looked like after Be Bethlehem Steel's engineers came in from the east to revamp the whole factory, including the way railroad, the private railroad, moved things around the site. Um, this new, simpler, faster scheme, if you've played with a toy railroad, um, you know that this would have caused some of this backing up and so forth was pretty complex, but this is just a smooth loop. It's literally organized for through flow, moving things as quickly and efficiently from one part of the site to another. And they had organized the entire factory site for through flow. Why is through flow important? It's the same reason you want to go around go more often when you're playing Monopoly. Each time the money goes around, you get paid. To, you, you get paid. You get a profit each time the money goes around. And so you move things faster inside the factory. You're not tying up your capital waiting for it to make something. You can sell something. You get paid for something. And you can build something more. And you get richer each time. Bethlehem Steel had figured this out better than the old local owners of the, of the Union Ironworks. And here it is, um, a different kind of connection, uh, an outreach, if you will, from the new management um, who are saying quite clearly who they are. 
For all we know, the workers might have welcomed this particular management outreach, although I have yet to find an employee diary with a line like, we all love the new rail line scheme of the bosses. Um, we do know that inside that huge machine shop, and this is a view of it, the amazing little parts on the side and the big engines are being assembled in the middle. This building, by the way, still stands. It did not fall down or burn up in the 1906 earthquake. So we're fighting to actually preserve this building in San Francisco. Hardest thing is to figure out what to do with so much space on the waterfront, um, beautifully located, with a site so poisoned you have to put down like two feet of concrete to seal it against all the stuff in the ground. But at any rate, um, this, right in the middle of it, you see a little booth. And here's a close-up of that booth, not quite in focus, because I made that, that shot myself. Um, we do know uh, that workers at, uni at the Union Ironworks dislike the new scientific management type of supervisors for whom the company built these control booths about 1910. The old style of foremen who worked their way up from the ranks used to be scattered around the shop. The new style of management, introduced by the engineers who worked with Frederick Winslow Taylor, uh, were supervisors trained by the management to be managers. They weren't machinists. So uh, uh, they worked out of booths like this, and they were like aliens. Uh, coming in from another planet, and they had a good deal of power over how you spent your days. Uh, so the rank-and-file machinists complained a good deal about it. Uh, now, whether it has innocuous or diabolical effects, reaching out to other groups in the present, like the topless carrot firm, or the Bethlehem Steel Management, implies reaching out to groups in the past as well. And that brings us to the fourth type of connection. Um, human groups <coughs> require some level of continuity. And continuity maintains order and stability in the social and cultural reproduction of groups. Rural landscapes are, of course, very famous for their potential continuity, like the big Sandy Mush Valley here near Asheville, North Carolina. I often wonder if people who leave standing long abandoned houses um, are consciously leaving links to a past. But the need and existence of continuity are as true in commercial and industrial cultures as in traditional rural places. Here we see an empty office building that preservationists in Buffalo, New York were fighting to preserve back in 1985. You can see the site, the site, historic site available for restoration, Call Burlow. Uh, I think this tells you more about it. Uh, by the way, this is the little sign where he, it's a boy is right there. The Hummer Inn is still open in an otherwise empty office building. Um, now what happens to that little low rent cafe tenant when the building gets spiffed up, if it gets spiffed up? So does preservation help? Does it hurt? Who does it help? Who does it hurt? You know, these are all, again, complex questions. I have no answers for you tonight. You have to work those out case by case. Um, we have to keep in mind in that process that continuity does not rest in the object alone but in the webs of significance a human group weaves between themselves and the ob object. Thus, the continuity of a healthy landscape results from the continuing viability of social and cultural systems as well as objects like the building we're looking at here. Uh, indeed, continuity is a fragile, complicated process, uh, but site management and design can help in determining whose histories of a place people will learn in the present day. Um, in our visually oriented culture, site interpretation done graphically can be particularly effective. Um, for the U.S. Bicentennial in 1976, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi's office designed the architectural interpretation system of Franklin Court, a few blocks from Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Um, they rebuilt uh, a series of, of buildings that, that, that Ben Franklin had actually developed Ben Franklin had bought a site that looked like this, and some of those buildings were there. He actually rebuilt some. There's a, 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 an archway through into the middle of the block where he built his house. He added onto his house. He added onto those buildings. We're seeing that complete set down there. Um, the archway, I think, is can you see the archway in that photograph? There it is. And then his children apparently hated him. And uh, <laughs> when he died, his heirs demolished his house and built in a whole series of tenements in the, in the back alley. You know, uh, so uh, there's a story there that I can't tell you as much about as I should, should know. Um, but in that archway, um, 
and this sign is right near that arch, so you can see how the, how the city has changed over time. It's a great graphic way to tell us, in, if we can read plans, how things have changed over time, and that the fact that they've re reconstructed the front of the building. Um, but there is a sign in that archway that says, this is the original passage through which Franklin walked to and from his house. Very useful. What they didn't say, now there are several of you in the room who will know if I'm saying the truth or not. I'm, we'll have to talk about that later. At least I tell my students that if you walk through the archway and look across the street, there are actually some fragments of buildings that might have been buildings Ben Franklin looked at. But history is the Ben Franklin side of the street, and across the street isn't history. As David Lowenthal writes about the American way of history, it's got a charge of mission, have a fence around it, and charge of, you know, I think, charge of mission, have a fence around it, and have a sign. That's history. So Franklin Court is history. But what Franklin might have looked at are these buildings from not too long. Afterwards, as some of them, um, uh, that's not, not, not history. So don't, don't look at that. Um, uh, so again, we have to define what we mean. Um, The Franklin Court information is necessarily highly filtered uh, and does have these odd ideas about history uh, worked into it. Note that if we are prompted to focus too much of our consciousness on professional design rather than on whole cross sections of landscape, we're in danger of joining an insidious idol cult. J.B. Jackson called that cult artolatry, um, making art the idol of goodness. That is, holding the notion that only professional design is worthy of preservation or interpretation. That's like saying that only people with a pacemaker, a professionally altered heart, um, have good cardiovascular systems. Jackson was always emphatic on this issue. Art, he said, can only adorn what the human spirit has already created. In preservation and continuity terms, um, we might instead look for what the geographer Yifu Tuan, I'm sorry, Yu, Yifu Tuan, um, has evocatively called a field of care. Fields of care, in part, exhibit steady and sufficient, and often more than sufficient, investments of capital and investments of time and maintenance. Certainly on the left, uh, you would probably agree that Beacon Hill in Boston is a very artful place. Um, and if we look at the Mania uh, district in Philadelphia, um, it's not of the same social class as, as Beacon Hill, but lots of maintenance going on here. They have paved over the whole sidewalk in front uh, and kept it up, uh, replaced it. They've re stuck out the fronts of their houses, put in aluminum windows. There's aluminum awnings that have been put on, painted up. Uh, there's a steady and constant amount of management and care being shown in Manium, just as there is in Beacon Hill. Uh, Beacon Hill might get preserved and put on the National Register, Manion might not. Um, mind you, I have nothing particular against art, but we must repeatedly ask, whose art is it? What does it mean in this landscape for these people? Um, in fact, what does the art mean to various groups of people who inhabit the landscape? And what power relations are being reinforced? Here's an example from my hometown of Mayville, North Dakota, on the eastern edge of North Dakota. Um, we have to remember that North Dakota is part of the Siberia of the U.S., um, a, a region, a part of a region of the Great Plains that's essentially an economic colony of the rest of the United States. They send out all their raw materials and they have to import all their ma manufactured goods from the rest of the U.S. Um, and this is the bank, the, uh, the, the old bank in town, uh, very close to the railroad station. Um, it's a very distant echo of the Richardsonian Romanesque style with some 1950s remodeling here in Glass Block. Um, Boston-based bankers, the Grandons, uh, owned most of the stock in the bank, and it was run by a couple of very wealthy farm families who also had stock in the bank. Um, the, uh, uh, they had a Minneapolis designer design the the building, it's got high brow style, uh, it's got stone as part of the facade. There is no building stone within 300 miles of Mayville, North Dakota, so that stone was imported from a long ways away to make this building really unusual on Main Street. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the Grandons, who owned the bank, were, uh, uh, were out of town 11 months of the year. 
Um, they would come every September to do accounts at their huge corporate farms nearby, um, and, uh, and also to do accounts at the bank, and to hunt pheasants. That's why they always came that particular month of the year. Um, uh, so for most of the locals, this landmark bank was a symbol of distant oppression, even to my father and his brothers. And they were business people on Main Street, my, my father's father. Um, and his children, my father and his brothers would stand by the railroad station and watch the Grandins arrive and watch the food that they shipped out with them uh, uh, unloaded from the, from the, uh, the railroad uh, as they arrived. And it was not the food that they ate. Um, in fact, we, I was told this story almost every time I wouldn't eat my food. You should like your fruit. I remember when the Grandins came to town and they had whole baskets of, of oranges and you know, spirit. You, can, you probably heard stories like this that were parallel. Um, so design talent in some ways can be a negative tool. It means a reinforcing inequality. Uh, any farmer who, who you know, had to mortgage the farm to pay for seed or machinery to keep the farm going, this was where Simon Legree lived. You know, um, and the best that he lived in, in Boston most of the year, where well, they didn't have to deal with them themselves. Um, so the old bank conjured up approximately the same meaning as a cavalry fort would have for the Sioux Nation in the western part of North Dakota. Now, uh, not, about 1980, while I was in design school, um, uh, and not yet appreciating old buildings like this, um, the people in Mayville built a new bank. Here's the new bank. Um, it's pretty lowbrow. It has six exterior materials. I will point out there's stone and brick and yellow panels and metal and it's pretty low, low brow in its design. The, the sign might be the most high style design of it all. It's clearly owned by local stockholders. The Grandins are long gone. They, they left in the 1930s. Uh, the drive-in area has, has painted trees for you landscape folks. Uh, so, uh, and little shrubs out front. They've all died in the shrubs. You know, nothing lives in that, that area. Um, it's not high art. Uh, but it's not a collection of distant talent. It's their bank. You know, my mother and her friends and the farmers liked this bank. This building speaks to them. So we might want to preserve the bank on the other end of Main Street, the old Grand and Bank, because it's a famous family and it's, you know, it's a, at least it's high style design. But this is the bank that we probably should chain ourselves to uh, to maintain if we're going to worry about banks at all. I guess we've been through that as a society, haven't we? Um, let's not go there. Um, so connection to continuity is important, but like all connections, it's fraught with complications. So too is another realm of social connection. Um, good social connections must also allow not just continuity, but flexibility, and thus connect their participants to change. The human relations and physical orders of a good landscape are not too tight. They have loose edges or open spots for spontaneity and chance contact and use. The rural grid of the US, uh, west of the Appalachians, these section line roads that you see here, this great one mile square grid of roads, um, shows an amazing capacity for loose fit and change. Um, the, uh, you can put in a uh, shelter belt in the 1930s, you can change the locations of farmsteads from four per square mile to one per square mile with a change of, of, of farming te technology and economies, and everything's still well connected. So there's loose fit in that rural grid. Um, my, my teaching assistant said to explain what was going on when we looked at this in a, in a neighborhood, a low-income neighborhood of East Oakland. It's not a car that's been junked. It's a car that's being used as, as, as a repair facility. It's a parts depot. Um, and people are fixing and repairing cars on the side of the street. Now this, see, this is very unmodern. In the medieval period, doing whatever you wanted to do in the street was just fine. Like it was normal. His houses were small and dark and usually either too cold or too hot. So working in the street made a lot of sense. Um, now today we think, oh, what, this should not happen in the street. This isn't modern, this isn't right. Well, these people either don't know those rules or don't care about those rules, and the police are not enforcing them anyway. And new activities, other activities, multiple activities are going on in the street. It's got loose connection. It's got loose room for new things to, to go on. Um, this may be an extreme example. Um, so we move from connection to change 
to connection with wilder nature. You've been wondering probably when I was going to bring this up. Um, human landscapes, and this is the sixth kind of connection, the last kind of connection we're going to talk about. Uh, human landscapes are inextricably interconnected to the other parts of nature. And I'm choosing my words here very carefully and reading them word by word from my script. From the other parts of nature. I learned at Berkeley from a number of very smart people, many of them in the landscape department, that humans are part of nature. We're not separate from nature. Uh, and if we think that, we make that little rhetorical shift we think a different way than to think nature is out there uh, separate from us. Exceptionally healthy human and spatial relations must be in tune with climate, plants, and landforms, and hydrology. Um, and so this is a, a farm where the, uh, most of the soil has blown away in the New Deal. The, the farmers have lost their uh, farm to the bank in town, and they've come to California probably to pick fruit and later then to work in aircraft factories in Long Beach. Um, these are the, the farmers in North Dakota who lost a lot of soil due to that, the, the dirty 30s, as they called them, when the wind blew forever and there was a drought and they had no way to stop the wind. And they've planted all these shelter belts uh, about every third of a mile or every fourth of a mile to try to stop the wind, to help slow down the wind and retain some of the soil. So it's a response to a, a bad way of farming that uh, encouraged wind erosion. Um, if I showed these two images of Tuolumne Meadows up in Yosemite National Park to most Americans and asked them to vote on which image was more natural, they would instantly vote for the view on the left without people. Most of our American environmentalist groups work very hard in their publications to keep people clearly out of the views of pristine Yosemite or Great Barrier Reef. Um, this kind of photography and thinking betrays another insidious centuries-old idol cult, one that J.B. Jackson called wilderolatry. Wilderolatry is the mistaken notion that nature is only equal to pure wilderness. This makes a false idol out of some parts of nature, Jackson wrote. Wilderolatry, saying nature is out there and not in here, not in this lecture hall, isolates humans from themselves, Jackson wrote, and from their wilder, everyday surroundings. Wilderolatry thingifies nature into a sideshow or freak exhibit. This billboard, this is the J.B. Jackson slide. He would tell a long story about it when he lectured at, 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 at Berkeley. He would say, well, this, they're advertising a tape tour. So if you can't hear, if you're keeping up the window so it's air conditioned in your car, if you want to hear Glacier National Park, you can rent the tape and listen to it while you drive through the road and then give the tape back at the other end of the, of the park. So it's, it's, it's a, sub, a substitute, but it brings things into nature. But what it's doing to you is implying that nature is not already in your car. Your noisy kids in the back seat who don't want to be there. Now he sat on my side. You know, you remember being the bad kids in the back seat, perhaps. Um, or the bee caught behind your windshield. Um, there's plenty of nature inside your car. You don't have to hear National, a Glacier National Park come to life. Um, you can hear it right in your car. Um, so in an odd and wacky way, uh, the drive through tree up in Northern California uh, is a better connection to nature than a tape recorder in your car. At least it truly connects you and your car with a piece of nature. There's a drive on log, as you can see, and a drive through tree uh, up in the Redwood Parks of California. The private Redwood Parks, not the public Redwood Parks, which would never do something like this. Um, but there, there it is. The public Redwood Parks, um, like, the Fanny Tejas Grove are very serious. Um, they, you only can hike in them. There's a little ranger station you can stop at, and they might give you some maps, but you can't buy anything there. There's certainly no pie or coffee available. And then you go out and you, you hike, and you bring in those awful cliff bars, you know, and uh, whatever you can carry in. And then you look at the beautiful trees, and you go back out. Um, so, uh, and, and Fanny Kihaz gave the money, that's the Haas Lillenthal folks, the, the folks who brought you Levi Strauss, uh, the Levi's, uh, in San Francisco. So it's very nice of them to preserve uh, land this way so the Park Service can give us that official way of interacting with nature. Well, the beauty of the Redwood Parks in California, the little islands, 
And between the islands, um, in the cutover areas where the, the redwoods have grown up as second growth, there are these private little things, you know, the, the, the Axe gift shop here, and the Woodman Cafe, where you can buy pie and coffee. And across the street, you can buy a redwood burl um, uh, uh, table, uh, a coffee table to bring back home. Uh, you can't buy that in the National Park, uh, probably against the rules in the National Park. Uh, now I'm glad both are there. Uh, and so again, even preservation of nature asks, asks questions whose views of nature are being preserved? Um, and what class, what social class um, uh, is, is, is setting the rules of the way we start to think about nature and ourselves and our place in wilder na in, in, in nature or in nature that is wilder than ourselves? And indeed, our ideas and our urban design can be infused with a sense of larger systems and other species. The ethnobotanist Edgar Anderson writes that we too are a part of nature. Our cities are thus as natural as beehives. Um, if we erroneously define nature as something out there, Anderson writes, then we isolate ourselves from nature. Um, you see here two very different sets of street furniture. On the left, in Little Rock, Arkansas is street furniture designed only for the human species. And it's not bad, it's pretty clean. It's about 1965, and that was good design in 1965. That's why I took the picture. I was a good follower of design in those days. Um, on the right, uh, the main street of a small town in Maryland, the designers have added birdhouses as well as an aerial water course here um, to the sidewalk experience. Green Castle's builders are reaching out more to the wilder parts of nature. We all know the truism that rural people are more in touch with the wilder parts of nature than city people. Yet, um, again, as uh, um, Edgar Anderson says, the same kind of bond between rural people and the rest of nature can and does exist within the city, in the, in the city's climate, topography, and vegetation. Even the weeds growing in between the sidewalk um, are a connection to, to nature, if you think about it as being that. Um, and this volunteer corn stock uh, at a, uh, on the corner of Main Street in Richmond, Missouri is an example of this. I was stopping to take a picture of it, and I carefully kept the orange traffic cone over here that was keeping traffic away from running over the corn stock. And a local person walked up and said, how do you like our corn stock? We're all hoping it's going to grow a little more. You know, the whole town <laughs> rooting for this plant, on this little volunteer corn plant that had somehow found a, you know, a crack in the, in the street and was, you know, was, was, was growing there. Um, all right, S seasonal festivals are another urban contact with nature. I know for those of us in, Cal in coastal California, especially that we don't really have seasons the way they have in Wisconsin, but this is a very particular thermometer uh, on the main street of Stevens Point, a small college town in Wisconsin. Uh, the local folks watch this particular thermometer closely in the spring. And on the first day that the mercury of this thermometer hits 50 degrees, the bars in town all sell beer for a nickel. Imagine doing that in a college town. Um, the college and much of the whole town spontaneously closed down. It's a spring festival. You can't schedule it. It's only the, when this thermometer says it's 50 degrees. They have so much fun, they do it again on the first 60 degree day. <laughs> and after that winter, that really terrible, socked in winter of the, of the continental climate, really these, these kind of festivals make a lot of sense. Overall, if we can develop this view of humans as a part of nature, according to J.B. Jackson, there will be no need to wonder about the place of presumptuous humans in the timeless immensities of nature, for it will have been decided. A new road, a new dam, or a forest destroyed will matter deeply to us all. And we could add the empty lakes behind California dams during drought years. This is um, Lake Shasta when I first saw it in 1976, a drought year. Um, uh, things like Lake Shasta will matter deeply to us all. Jackson continues, not because something is happening to nature, but because something is happening to us. So, if you're wondering what we've been, where we've been going, um, with connection to wilder nature, we've moved through six key types of connections to and separations from people and their material environments. Connections from self to self, self to group, group to outsiders, stasis to change, change to continuity, and from culture to outer nature. 
Each criterion is a double-edged tool. Balance is needed in its use. Single-minded overemphasis, say too much social connection or too little social connection, can be harmful in the cultural landscape. Also, if we ignore the realm of connection altogether, it tends to force itself into our landscapes negatively. The clearest example is if we ignore the needs of the bioregion in our landscapes. We don't reach out and connect to them. Bioregion, uh, bioregional forces will reach in inexorably. Um, now, if I haven't riled you up at least once in this talk, then I have failed. Uh, that was part of my goals. Um, and for most of this lecture, you may have been asking, what about people? Well, yes, most visitors to a place, most people trying to suss out what's going on in a place, instinctively look first at the people in a place. And from the assessment of the people, they make much of their analysis about the location. As human beings, we are intrigued by others of our species. So clearly, we should not ignore people or any other sources of cultural understandings. We're trying to figure out a place rapidly when we're hired to make a design decision there. Uh, but too much, Americans ignore or are blind to the information that the ordinary, everyday built environment is also telling us. And this can be a blind side for professional architects and other designers as well. The environment is literally the sedimentation of social relations. Like sedimentation in a stream, where certain kinds of movement of water sort out certain kinds of gravel in one place or another, the landscape is the record of social relations in that place. If you know how to read class struggle, investment, connections, the things we've been talking about, the more you know, the more you can see, and the more quickly you can see it. It's a great. I now think, after you know, 35 years of not being an architect, that I would be ready to start building building, be ready to add a garden to an existing garden, because I think I'm beginning to see how things cook together quickly enough. Uh, I, I remember when I was a uh, young, uh, young employee in a, a design office, I lasted only six months and decided that I would be better off as a historian, but um, I did just hang a facade on, on a one-story addition to a hospital as a, a clinic addition. I hung a very handsome facade on it. It was 90 miles from where the office was. I didn't even have photographs. There was no Google. Imagine a time with no Google Earth. Um, there was no, I knew nothing about what the surroundings of this building were. And no one thought that was unusual. We've come back, unfortunately. Not here. I, I really liked what I saw uh, uh, in your, on your design boards upstairs in Watts. Watthall? Watthall. What hall is it? It's what hall. Um, it's old, I imagine, here on campus. Um, at Berkeley, we're very much into squiggly buildings. You know, a parametric design is reigning the room. We, we're back to form for form's sake, which I thought we had figured out how to get rid of in 1960 or so. Uh, so we're very much at Berkeley and many other design schools. Back to form is form's sake. So we need to, I think, relearn how to see the environment in place, to make ourselves better designers, to make decisions about places, to not hire a young designer to hang a facade on a building 90 miles away without having even a photograph of anything around or have any sense of what was around that place. Um, so the environment is a sedimentation of social relations. It's a series of stories waiting to tell themselves to you if you just ask about them. And as the graffiti here on the left say, and I did not paint that graffiti, the, wall, the walls of the American city do speak, and so too the furrows and the shelter belts of the countryside speak eloquently if we learn their language. Indeed, the walls of the city and the planting of the country speak of who we are, who we have been, and who we are in the process of becoming. Seeing connection in the landscape might just be a beginning analysis of our environments, the beginning of the process of deciding why we preserve environments, what we should be preserving, and who we might be affecting as we preserve or as we design. Thank you very much. <laughs>